So, I'm happily married to a lady that I met 40 years ago this month. We have four marvelous children, aged from 32 to 26. We are from Zimbabwe, hence my accent. Um, but now we live in Oxford, UK, where I am a candidate for a PhD, and uh, my wife continues to be a high school teacher. I was keen to be at this conference once I, I saw its uh, theme, but I, am, and, but I am as surprised as you are to find myself standing up here. As I said to Tarina this morning, things happen amazingly quickly. Yeah. The title of my paper deviates slightly from the theme due to my personal and academic interest in well-being. And so where it said sustainable development and economic growth, as you can see, I've changed that very slightly to and well-being. Um, and we'll talk about that, obviously, uh, throughout the, the range of this talk. So I'll start out talking about artisanal gold mining, uh, because that's the, the, the target population for fair trade gold, which I'll explain as we go along. Uh, and I'll talk about their use of mercury. Uh, then I'll mention the global ban that's on mercury. And then that's on the one side of this bridge that we're talking about, building this economic bridge. And then I'll jump to the other side of the bridge and I'll talk about fair trade uh, from the European perspective, fair trade gold. And then I'll try and link these two halves of the bridge uh, using the concept of well-being. And so I hope uh, that that brings together the theme of, of today's conference. So let's proceed then. So the word uh, artisanal gold mining uh, is translated um, in slang in different parts of the world, Garyamperos in Brazil uh, and South America. Makorokosa is the Zimbabwean word. Galamsi is a word they use up in Ghana. And diggers is a word that's used uh, pretty universally in English in other English parts of the world. But there are many, many slang words for artisanal gold mining. And every country, every region has got its own uh, name for it. Now, I'm not sure with the light being as it is that you can see anything uh, within this picture, but what it shows is a bunch of people milling around in a stream where they are panning for gold uh, in the sands of the stream. The next picture, the, re the reason why they're called artisanal miners is because they rely very heavily on handheld tools. Uh, there's very little machinery, very little capital. Here you can see things like shovels, uh, chisels, and hammers. Uh, that would be used by artisanal miners. Um, there's a typical artisanal mining underground operation. Uh, I've just shown you a, a, a riverbed operation, but the guys would follow a, a reef, a seam of gold underground, and they would have very rudimentary uh, access, and if it could be like this uh, an incline, or it could be a vertical shaft, and the vertical shaft would similarly probably be lined with, with timber that just comes from the surrounding area. And here we have, and there's a bit of a pun here, crushing example. I don't mean that just the ladies who are crushing the rock that's been mined from underground using hammers, as you can see. But it's also, to me, it's a kind of a crushing thing to be this, this deeply involved uh, in, in this kind of labor-intensive work. And then the last shot, and I'll come back to this in a few moments, is of a guy panning gold. Again, you can see he's his, uh, half in water. So there's two ways in which we can see these pictures. We can see them, oh, it's gone back too far. We can see them either as chaos, as hardship, as a hard scrabble life, as difficult. We can see this as, as, as a source of conflict minerals. We can see this as a situation where children are involved uh, and working very hard. But if we take off that lens, and try and look at this, these same scenes from within the eyes of the people who are doing the work, what we see is a slightly different picture. We see a picture of people who are willing to work. They're not queuing for employment in the cities. There's no urban drift here. We see people who are, uh, the, the big word is autotelic. They've got their own purposes in life. They're doing their own thing. They're not asking anyone for anything. There's no money involved. There's just a few tools which are easily accessible at any hardware shop. And uh, I haven't shown things like wheelbarrows. But they're also uh, uh, easily available and used by the miners. And what we see, in fact, uh, from their perspective, is a genuine desire to make a livelihood out of the resources in their local neighborhoods, in their local rivers and streams, soils and rocks. And we see a genuine uh, hard work being done here. Um, and so. The, the world of artisanal gold mining is kind of caught 
between those who wish to see it improved and, and uh, the universals of, of poverty alleviation and, and uh, environmental impact and these things against the ones who are doing it themselves. And the ones who are seeing, seeing themselves doing it, are they, they don't care if they're outside the law. They don't care if they're called informal. They don't care if it's a family that's involved in the mining. They just see this as a, as a wonderful opportunity to perhaps strike it rich, uh, to, to, to do real work that, um, that, that gives them a livelihood. Now, some of the gold is as little as, as two-tenths of a gram a day. And at the moment, a, a gram of gold is worth about 24 pounds or 40, 40, 42 US dollars. And so if you get a gram of gold in a day, you're going to earn $40. And a gram of gold is, is a lot compared to what these guys are normally pulling out. They're pulling out half a gram down to even a quarter of a gram on a day's work. It's a very, very hard life that these artisanal gold miners have chosen for themselves. And there's two ways of seeing that. Now, this would be okay if there wasn't a problem with mercury. Now, in the process of gold, I want you to imagine this guy sitting here. He's panning, panning out the, uh, the sand and the flow, and the water's pushing out the sand, and the heavy gold particles are staying in the center of his pan, which you can see there. And then there comes a point where he thinks, well, that's far enough now. He'll reach into his pocket, and he'll bring out a little vial of mercury. And he'll pour the mercury into that pan. He'll mix it around with his fingers. And the mercury will amalgamate with the gold, leaving behind the sand and the water and any other minerals that might have been caught up there, any other heavy minerals that may be uh, in the sand with the gold. And he will then have this little amalgam of, of gold and, and mercury. He'll pour that into a muslin cloth of some kind. And then he'll twist that and twist that and twist that. And the free mercury will come out along with any water. And then what will be left behind inside this little tiny ball will be a small amount of gold, a tiny amount of gold. And that will then go back to the person's home probably because of security reasons where over an open fire that uh, using a shovel, that uh, tiny bit of gold will be heated. And in that heating, the mercury will be driven off, leaving behind, again, a few particles of sponge gold. That sponge gold then is... is Within a couple of days, uh, somebody will arrive from the nearby town, the nearby city, with a pocket full of cash, and that person will negotiate with the miner what the quality of the gold is, what the quantity of the gold is. None of this is measured. It can't be measured. It's out in the bush. And a deal will be reached between the, the, the gold dealer and the miner, and, and the money will change hands, and probably mercury, because the gold dealers themselves are also selling the mercury, and then the gold dealer will disappear back to wherever that come from, and the miner will continue to work uh, incessantly, really. Life just goes on. Once the gold dealer has got all the sponge gold, the gold dealer will amalgamate, uh, will, 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 will burn all this off together in, in a furnace of some kind until, really, the amount of gold is about a kilogram. And then a kilogram is about the size, uh, a kilogram of gold is about the size of an average cell phone. So if you want to imagine what a kilogram of gold looks like, look at your cell phone. And then that, that kilogram of gold will then probably go up to somewhere, the, the major city or the capital of, of this world. And this world extends from South America right through uh, sub-Saharan Africa and into, um, into Southeast Asia. And then that gold is then usually smuggled out of the country. It's not declared to the fiscus. No taxes are paid. Uh, and the gold then disappears out of the country and... Um, it just disappears. And once it reaches a refinery, and the, and the big refineries in, in North America, Europe, Dubai, um, then that gold loses its fingerprint. It can no longer be um, identified where that gold came from because it's now refined to 99,99% pure. And that gold then goes into the system as gold bullion, and its price is traded on a daily basis with the London Metal Bulletin Metal Bullion Association and they determine the price of that kilogram of gold. Uh, and then that gold then just goes in, into the world and becomes jewelry, or it becomes money, or it just goes into a bank and sits there as security. So that's, that's the story of the gold. So far, not really a problem, excepting mercury. And the real problem with mercury is that about 1,400 tonnes a year of mercury is now being lost into 
the, the important lungs of the world, and I've just mentioned them, Amazon jungle, Congo uh, and African savannah, and the, and the jungles of Southeast Asia. And 1,400 tons is an awful lot of mercury that's been lost into the system. Why? Because just a few drops of mercury are enough to contaminate a, a, a lake, as, as you can see, as there's this picture showing a few drops of mercury. And so this is the real concern that, that, that is troubling, troubling the world right now. This amount of mercury is being liberated into the eco ecology of the world. Now, why is mercury a problem? Well, um, it all started realizing what a danger mercury was in a city called Minamata in Japan. And you can see where it is there, uh, in the most southern part of Japan. In 1956, doctors, uh, people started to report to doctors that their newborn children or their children were behaving, they were very ill. And so the Japanese town of Minamata put together a little group to go, try and investigate what was going on and why children were born. And I, again, the pictures are so bad, but you may just see from, uh, from there that there's some very seriously deformed uh, young children in, in these pictures taken in, in the mid-1950s. And so the, the Japanese town investigated, didn't know what was going on. But they did learn a few other things. One, there was something called mad cat disease, and that all the cats in that town were also behaving very strangely. They would keep falling over when they were walking. And so it was known as mad cat or dancing cat disease. There were no fish. The fish kept dying in the bay at Minamata. And finally, there was no seaweed growing along the shore. And so there was obviously poisoning going on at a, on a massive scale. So uh, it, it obviously escalated out of, out of Minamata until eventually, um, uh, it was established that a local chemical factory called the Chiso factory was pumping mercury sludge and other heavy metals into the bay. And the food chain was the fish would eat and the shellfish would, would, would digest the mercury, the cats and the people would eat the fish, uh, and, and then they were being poisoned. Now, just to give you a feel for that, you're, right now in your hair, you've probably got four parts per million of mercury. Every human, everywhere in the world, the average is four parts per million. The people that you can see in these pictures and who died had over 700 parts per million of mercury toxicity in, in, in them. And so they were really in, in, in a terrible, bad, bad shape. Um, not all the children died. He, he has a young man uh, who, who appeared in Stockholm at, in 1972 at the Stockholm Conference, uh, which became the United Nations Environmental Program. So after this conference, the UNEP was formed, and one of the major um, aspirations of the UNEP program is the banning of mercury. Uh, and so that, that's a young man who was, who was there then. Mercury poisons the world. I mean, the fear is not only that, that it, once it gets into the water systems of the world, where is it going to travel to? Uh, and and how, how much danger is there from mercury uh, around the world? So last, So for some years now, UNEP have been building up to a global ban on mercury. And in October 2013, just a few months ago really, about a year ago now, um, in Minamata, deliberately, a huge convention was, was ratified by 93 countries of the world that they would uh, agree to the ban of mercury, both its uses and its production, and that um, they would phase out the use of mercury worldwide. Now, for most people in the West, of course, this isn't a problem. I mean, how many of us have got mercury in our teeth or mercury thermometers or mercury switches or mercury light bulbs? These are things that we can pretty much live without. But for the artisanal gold miners, this is, strikes at the very core of their livelihood. And so my fear and the fear of many people, particularly fair trade, I'll come back in a moment, is that this mercury is going to end up on the black market. And when you look at who the producer countries are, you, you, you do begin to fear a little bit because the, the producer countries are, are, are not, haven't ratified the convention, number one, and two, are not maybe that likely to stop the production of mercury. It's countries like Russia. Um, and so th there is this fear now that mercury will simply move on to the black market. Uh, so... So that's one side of, of this bridge. So we've got this, the, the, the miners themselves. That's my world and the mining engineers I was introduced to you a few minutes ago. 
and the miners are using mercury, and there's a problem with mercury. But on the other side of the world, literally on the other side of the world, there's another thing going on altogether. We have something called fair trade. And we have fair trade organisations. I've just given a couple of labels here. Um, fair trade Max Havilar and fair trade now gold and silver. And I'm on the fair trade technical advisory group for gold and silver. Hence my background. So what's fair trade then? Fair trade is a system that was started by Mexican coffee growers who came to Holland uh, and said, we want to find new markets for our, our coffee and we want it to be traded so we get more money back to our cooperatives in Mexico. And if you know anything about Max Havilar, um, he was a character in a Dutch novel uh, way back in, uh, written about Indonesia and the struggles of the small farmers against the Dutch coffee estates. And so Max Havilar then became the name of the first fair trade outfit uh, based in, in, in Holland and uh, is now pretty much all over Europe. And so fair trade has been going quite well for a long time. And now fair trade are moving into this world of fair trade precious metals and precious stones. And so we are, we are finding that they are now moving into this. Now why are they moving into this is the question. Well, it's coming from you. It's coming from the general public. The general public are walking into jewelry shops on the high streets of Europe and saying, uh, this wedding ring that I'm about to buy for my, my fiance and, and, and her engagement ring uh, and our wedding rings, how do we know that, that this isn't conflict gold? How do we know this is a blood-free diamond? How do we know that, that, that this isn't a mess? Okay, I, I'm sure I can do it in five minutes. Um, and so the fair trade organization under pressure uh, so, so the jeweler's been under pressure from the customers. The customers have then been under, uh, put, uh, the customers put the pressure on the jewelers. The jewelers have gone into fair trade and said, please, can we do something about this? We need to certify that the jewelry we are selling now in Europe, North America, etc., is somehow fair traded. And so the ripple down effect now is that fair trade is moving into this world of jewelry manufacturing on the raw material side. So... So on the one hand, we've got the, the people in the first world who see the need to be ethical in their shopping habits now, in their consumer habits, whether it be agricultural products, chocolate, whatever, clothing, and then on the, and, and, and now fair trade jewellery. And then on the other hand, we've got these miners who desperately need money in order to buy alternatives for mercury. Because all alternatives to mercury are very expensive and very difficult and, and basically require some sort of organization to make them work. And so what I'm saying is that you've got a sense in the West that I will have more well-being if I can buy fair traded uh, stuff, including jewelry. And we have a sense that banning mercury is somehow going to promote the well-being of the world. And, and ultimately, the miners have to learn to live with that. And so I see well-being as the link then between the high street customer who's going to be putting money in to buying fair trade jewellery, which will cost a little bit more than ordinary jewellery, as all fair trade products do. But that money then gets shunted back to the miner, and the miner can then spend some of that money on, um, on mercury-free technology. And part of that money, there's a whole system built into it that that money has to be spent on the community and not just on wine, woman, and song, as it were. So, you could, the, so the fair trade are putting in a special premium for ecological gold, and I won't go through that, but it's all about not using mercury. And we've got universities, companies, all looking at mercury-free equipment. There's training and incentives to reduce mercury use going on even as I speak right now. There are many organizations out there in uh, South America, East Africa, West Africa, uh, Southeast Asia. Governments are bringing in new regulations. The ones who've ratified this agreement have, are now having to bring in very strong uh, mercury, anti-mercury regulations. But when it comes down to it, none but ourselves can change our minds. Thanks, Bob Marley. Wonderful quote. Um, and really, it's what it comes down to. Is all these other people can do all of this, the three uh, groups that I mentioned above. But at the end of the day, it's going to take the miners themselves to change their minds. And so we can do it by giving them more money through fair trade environment. But maybe there's also another way. Um, so that there's really they've got to have to be organized to supply enough tonnage for this equipment, to get the capital equipment and keep it going. Um, 
But we need to th think about how we can uh, proceed with guys like this. There's, that's one set of issues that comes out of fair trade. Um, but the other thing is there's a lot of families out there that are just doing the mining in these rural areas. And they don't really understand well-being from, from a Western perspective. Um, they've got a strong sense of community in Africa. They have very strong cultural views on, on mining and gold. And they have a religiosity which, uh, which allows them to cope with a lot of ill-being and with a lot of well-being. And so there is, I think, another way forward, and this is really where my PhD is going, is how can I access the communities themselves and talk to them about their understanding of gold rather than the Western fair trade view and how can we get the local cultures to get involved with reducing the use of mercury. Your part, may I encourage you to join us by reflecting on who in your world shows sincere well-being? Think about well-being. What does it mean to you? Think ethically when it comes to jewellery. My friend Greg Valerio has written a fabulous book, which you can find on, on Google. Greg Valerio has written a book called Making Trouble, Establishing Fair Trade in the Jewellery Industry. He's a jeweller himself. Um, everything that I've said today and will be in my paper when it gets uh, published, is all can be found on Google and Wikipedia. I, I, I haven't written a long esoteric bibliography I've kept the whole thing at this level so that you yourself can become more knowledgeable on artisanal gold mining, mercury, and fair trade. It's all out there. You can look it up yourself. And then it would be really nice if you put your pressure, put pressure onto your high street jeweler. The next time you go downtown, uh, even if you don't intend to buy any jewelry, just walk in and say to the jeweler, excuse me, is this ethical? Is this clean? Is this blood free? Is this conflict free? Is this child labor free? This jewellery that I'm buying from you? Shock him. Her. Shock them. It's time the world realised that there's some ethical changes going on here, even in the jewellery sector. Put pressure on your local jeweller. Thank you. Thank you. It was really interesting. I'm interested in, do you know the movie like that was our association to this uh, topic, uh, Blood Diamond? Do yes. you think it really influenced... Uh, the way people are thinking today about uh, jewellery. Thank you. Yes, it had a big influence because jewellers, my friends who are jewellers, tell me that people walk in and literally say that. Is this a blood-free diamond? Now, they may not know what they mean, but they have an idea that we don't want anything that's involved with conflict. Yeah. So it had a big impact on in and through the media. Um, that uh, um the, the way of mining gold is uh, essentially artisanal. They provide about 13% of the world's gold now. So I'm not saying it's the only way, but it's they provide more than one-tenth of the world's gold now okay. is coming from artisanal miners. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, how, what is the, the, the modern way of uh, mining gold, actually? Is it, like, uh, is it already operational or... I don't know. Do Good. you have a, a way of yeah. uh, doing yeah. it differently from uh, the way. Yeah, so the big scale mining, which is my personal background, I spent my whole life as a mining engineer in large scale and medium scale mines, not this micro scale. Um, they have big uh, plants that process hundreds of tons of, of, of rock a day in, in ways that do not require any mercury. So the mercury is really very much a small-scale artisanal or micro scale activity. But any mine that's is processing, let's say, uh, 10 tons a day or more is probably not using mercury. So, but the, what's the, the point of your PhD you are actually doing? What do you want to really uh, come out with? What's the, the main issue? The main issue is to, is to supply technology that is being developed right now to the small miners that they will no longer need to use mercury. Ah, okay. And that's called, merc yeah, we call it mercury-free technology. And so, but, but the problem with that is that it requires a certain amount of capital, it requires a certain amount of organization, it requires a certain amount of formality, you, have to, you may have to go and borrow money from the bank, and all of this makes it difficult for the miners, the, the very poor, the, the real ultra-scale, micro-scale miners. Um, and so I'm, that's why I'm also thinking, can we go through the more traditional community routes speaking to the traditional elders, speaking to the church leadership, speaking to respected members of the community to also try and put pressure on the miners to stop using mercury. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Um, 
mind the question and the comment. So maybe I should start with the comment first. Uh, the question I asked today and your conclusion, shouldn't we be saying therefore that cultural diplomacy should aim at promoting ethical morality amongst the people? Yes. Um, especially through cultural performances, additional culture, tradition, customs, to show that society initially cared for the well-being of every member of the society and every segment. Unlike now that society is getting so materialistic that we make money, we forget the well-being of people. Yes. I think that should be in cultural diplomacy to lead to. And that's why I'm saying that this is one thing that says the world is one. Each person is a culture. Each one of us is a culture. And no one sees culture, his or her culture, as evil, as bad. That's right. Mm. However, do not see other people's culture as very good. So we should use this movement to sensitize the world that we are one people and we all come from good culture and that some culture uh, have some bad points or all cultures have some bad points which we should uh, be discouraging and moving to the ethical uh, culture. That's my comment. My question is, isn't mercury also used in production of currencies? What are we saying about that? These paper notes. Yeah. Isn't mercury involved in their production? It could well be, but that's the sort of thing that can be phased out. That's not a problem for Western technology. If they want to phase mercury out of, out of banknotes, they will be able to. Yeah. That's why they're quite happy to sign this agreement. It's the ones who can't see how to replace mercury, the miners, that are not happy. Yeah. Um, but I like your thought about culture. Thank you and well-being. Um, I, I really do. And that's why I accepted the opportunity to speak here is because I see fair trade as more of a cultural thing than I see it as an economic thing. It's changing the culture of people, how we shop, how we do things. 